Hi, this is Paul. As I was sitting in the dentist chair, dentist has been like a Monday morning thing for me for a while. <sighs> At least I can move the side of my mouth again. I was thinking about what to call perhaps my Monday videos because so often I preach on Sundays back before COVID. I was doing Sunday school. Sunday school hopefully will start up again maybe in the next few months as more and more of our regular Sunday school folks get vaccinated and all of this. California, California, state of California says no more COVID restrictions come middle of June. And wow, I sure hope so. That'd be wonderful. But I was sitting in the dentist chair this morning thinking I should really just have a regular Monday morning video or Monday afternoon video that I call Sunday leftovers because I always think of things as I'm after my rough draft on Friday, as I'm going over my sermon in preparation for Sunday, as I preach it on Sunday, once we have Sunday school class again, I always get these new realizations that sort of continue to bubble up from the videos that I do during the week, from the thinking that I do during the week, from my Sunday sermon. And as I often say with my, fr my Friday rough draft or Saturday rough draft, you know, things change by Sunday. And in my Sunday sermon, I had that little section on superheroes. And, you know, as I, I wrote the sermon on Wednesday, Thursday, and then I did the rough draft on Friday, and then I, I go over it again by myself Sunday morning, and then I preach it on Sunday. And I was a little worried about the transition um, in terms of how the superhero section fits, because the demographic for my YouTube audience is quite different from the demographic on Sunday morning, and I sort of keep both in mind when I'm making my sermon. But I was thinking about how and why we use superhero stories and fantasy stories, magic, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Marvel Cinematic Universe, why we use these stories and how we use these stories and why these stories please us and form us and inspire us and colonize us. And I think we use them as sort of a distributed cognition. I think that's, I think that's in our culture and, and increasingly in our world, because these movies are, are movies that the whole world goes out. This is, in some ways, these movies are global distributed cognition. Now, there are a lot of people in the globe, seven to eight billion people. So not everybody sees these movies, but these movies have about as much reach as almost anything that we have culturally that is substantive, that is formative, and, and so in some ways, these movies are attempts at, at distributed cognition, global distributed cognition. And, and the fact that these movies are fantasies, I think, in some ways, puts them at arm's length. Now, I, um, my daughter got up this morning and was telling me about some crazy dream that she was having. And this one particular daughter has always had crazy dreams. And I was listening to her dream, and of course there were elements of the dream that made sense given the events of her life and our household life. And I was thinking again about, okay, what are dreams, and how do they function, and, and, and what, what is really going on with them? And, and then my friend James, who said he was going to performatively unsubscribe because I was teasing him, my friend James talking about, you know, the question is, as to whether or not we're not actually always dreaming, but it's just in our waking hours, the impact of the physical world via our senses is so important and profound. Our dreams sort of get pushed down. And so then when we, we sleep at night, our dreams sort of come to the surface and, and we continue to process and make sense. And so I think in a lot of ways, movies, you know, not not just fantasy or superhero fiction, and not even just fiction, because anyone who looks at our telling of history knows that in many ways our telling of history is dreamlike. We're, we're trying to work out our morality, how we should act, what how we should live. We're always trying to do all of this stuff, and we're trying to do it globally and communally, because if we can do things together, we can accomplish things. And so I think this is a lot of what we're really doing with stories in our in our minds. 
Now, remember, stories are massive, lossy compression algorithms for a world too big for us to manage. And again, back to Benjamin Boyce's conversation with John Verveke now a while ago, you know, when he, when they were sort of talking about story, you know, auto, basically autobiographying, I need a word for that, which is something that we start doing when we're two, three, or four, and we start to begin to organize ourselves as story, as autobiography. And I think in, in a lot of ways, these are important portions of what we might consider our soul. And, and so these stories, these autobiographies, and so the, the stories that we tell ourselves, these are massive distributed cognition, and they're, they're vital for, for sense-making. So rebel wisdom has sort of camped out on that sense-making idea, but, but that's, that's exactly what we're doing with sense-making. And then, so the news that is now so much up for debate, well, why is news so much up for debate? Well, there's many, many reasons for that, but a big part of that is because in the telling of the news, we're doing that sense-making and that distributive cognition, but our, our most foundational stories seem to be, in some ways, the most fantastical stories. Now, I was talking about this, oh, I didn't, I'll have to, I was talking about this on the Discord server Thursday or Friday. I got into a conversation with Shane and with um, with Andrea. I'm going to be talking to Andrea and um, Jonathan Peugeot coming up soon. That'll be a fun conversation. But I, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of, of storytelling and reciprocal broadening. So, of course, I've been watching The Critical Drinker because once you start watching someone on YouTube, they just keep you know, pushing you because YouTube wants to take over my life. Um, and he did a review on Thunder Force, which is, I didn't, I guess I saw, maybe saw it advertised on Netflix, but I didn't know anything about it. But he, he really panned the movie. And, you know, I, I, the movie didn't look terribly appealing. I don't know if I'd watch it anyway. But what struck me as he was going through the review of the movie and why he thought it was the movie was not, well, in his words, absolute garbage. The the well, what is garbage? Garbage is something that we throw in a bin, as you Brits would say, or we throw in the can, and someone takes it away because there's no point or useful for it in our life anymore. It's something we've used in some ways. So basically, his point with that movie was that they here they had some characters and they had a story and they could have done something interesting. Well, what would be interesting? Well, well, they could have actually worked on some of that distributed cognition that we're all sort of working through. That They could have made a contribution to humanity if they had used creative storytelling in order to do something productive for all of us. Now, again, there's huge variations of taste and people are always working on different things. And if you have a child sitting in front of any kind of video content, you know that children tend to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Jordan Peterson talks about this with respect to Pinocchio. And so in many ways, and you know, the one video I did that Jordan Peterson, that I know Jordan Peterson actually saw was my video a long, long time ago on The Office, where I was watching my young adult and teenage children rewatch and rewatch and rewatch The Office and how... I went through that video how the office had all these archetypal characters in it. And and I think in some ways what was happening with my young adult children was that they were they were processing a whole bunch of things through that literature, through that medium, okay? That's what they're that's what they're processing, that's what they're doing. Now, I've also been fascinated by this video that Jonathan Peugeot did on parasitic storytelling because there's been a whole lot of complaint about wokeness destroying storytelling. And this is parallel, as I mentioned in a video recently, to why so many Christian movies are just terrible movies. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. But I, I think actually beneath a lot of this, there, there's a fair amount of deep coding, okay? And and that that deep coding, we have an intuitive sense of reciprocal narrowing and reciprocal broadening. And, and part of the problem with woke storytelling, parallel to bad Christian movies, is because it winds up being reciprocally narrowing. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I think with reciprocal broadening, and even with this idea of sense-making, we, we begin to understand the whole world 
by virtue of that story. That story becomes a lens, and I'm riffing on C.S. Lewis here, um, you know, the, because, you know, why do I believe, you know, it's, I, I should have pulled up that Lewis quote, but, you know, why do I, why I see everything with it. I see everything through it. In other words, good storytelling is illuminating. And, and not just for the main, the main point. I mean, part of the problem with a lot of Christian movies are, as, as a lot of people on YouTube will tell you, they're just basically sermons. They're saying something about my profession. They're basically sermons. They have one point. And the point of wokeness, okay, I got the point. And, and that's part of what defeats these agendas, which is... Okay, I got the point, but your point isn't broadening the world. Your point is narrowing the world. Your point is reducing my agency. Your point is basically killing life instead of opening it up. And and, and that, in some ways, is the question. Jesus says, as I was thinking about all of these things in the dentist chair this morning, I come to give you life and life in abundance. And so I think that's, that's in a sense, a that verse is all about reciprocal broadening, that it's, it's through the correct story that now suddenly every other story comes alive and all other life comes alive. And if your reciprocal storytelling just makes the same, if you're, Storytelling just simply makes the same point again and again, or is parasitic upon other stories. You're you're not. It's not life giving. There's another phrase that you know has been popular for a little while. It's not life giving. It's not expanding the world in a productive way. And I think this is in some ways sort of a a good dead reckoning of okay, well, what's 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 leading us in the right direction and what's leading us down a blind alley. And so, you know, we do communal storytelling and think about that as distributive cognition in order to continue to recalibrate our mappings of the real world inside our mind. And this is, Jordan Peterson had that interesting interesting section in his conversation with Brett Weinstein that I played in my Mapping the Story Inside and the Story Outside video where Jordan is noticing that his granddaughter is sort of you know, processing Pocahontas. And and in some ways, Pocahontas for his granddaughter sort of becomes a prism through which she can engage the rest of the world. And if it weren't productive, I imagine children probably wouldn't use it because actually children are, are tremendously productive even when adults keep wanting to colonize and recalibrate their productivity, often in unhelpful ways. And, and I, there was a New York Times article that um, the memesters posted on their Twitter account that I said, you know, you gotta you gotta post the link to it because I, I I'm a digger. I dig these things down. And so a guide to neo pronouns: Are you a person, place, or thing? Okay, but this is what people are doing, and and they're trying it, and they're. They're, they're using fantasy because in some ways it's safe, but, but the fantasy is increasingly getting closer to the real world because that's exactly what we're trying to do, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, on the Discord server, someone mentioned, I do lurk more than I chime in on the Discord server, but, but someone mentioned, oh, I, I hope Paul does a commentary on, on Trent Horn versus Matt Delahunty on belief in the, is belief in the resurrection reasonable because I saw that there was some so then I searched it on YouTube and and did 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 Trent Horn say that the resurrection was unreasonable? <gasps> Atheist modernist pearl clutching. I tried to watch some of this. I just get very frustrated with this kind of content because I find this to be modernity leftovers. Um, a lot of debate around Easter time about the resurrection, there always is, and I find it entertaining, but mostly unproductive. Hardly a newsflash that these debates don't prove anything. C.S. Lewis's comment in Miracles, when modern writers talk about the resurrection, they usually mean one particular moment, the discovery of the empty tomb and the appearance of Jesus a few yards away from it. The story of that moment is what 
Christian apologists now chiefly try to support and skeptics chiefly try to impugn. And I look at this and there's a reason C.S. Lewis begins his book Miracles with a ghost story. Because as Lewis points out at the beginning of the book, you don't you don't win any debates here. People either believe or don't believe in ghosts based on the general mapping of their terrain, okay? And so what most of these most of these debates boil down to is do supernatural things happen? And you know, they're even getting into Craig Keener's book on miracles, but the point that Lewis makes here is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fork in the story. And the the point that many skeptics make to me, which is often, well, and and I and, and this this is a powerful point that skeptics make. Well, let I'll I'll give I'll give it to you, okay? I'll give it to you that Jesus walked out of that tomb, you know, hobnobbed with his disciples two thousand years ago, and then, you know, whoop, zipped up into heaven a little slower than through uh you know he didn't have a he didn't have a chariot of fire but that's the main point and and Lewis goes into this in his book miracles and Lewis's point is that what we're really talking about is the change of history and that's much closer to Tom Holland's Dominion than one of these little squabbles on the internet because truth be told, as Lewis says in the first chapter of Miracles, the, the mapping of the world that, that you experience things with determines what you see to a great degree. And, and this is where we get the, the story inside and the story outside and the constant recalibration of our mappings. And Rationality Rules did another Jordan Peterson video and just a little bit of commentary on the the Peugeot Peterson conversation, and you know I've been debating with myself if I wanted to talk about some of these points in a little bit more serious way. But but two early points that he makes are about the God of the intuitions and the God of the gaps, and and in some ways, my response to both of these points is exactly my response to which which arises from C.S. Lewis's first chapter of Miracles. The mapping that you have, the the default assumptions that you bring to personal experience guides what you see. Well, what do I mean by that? It guides the interpretation of what you see. And, you know, as the Horn Dillahunty conversation, what, what, what amazes me about these conversations is how much these conversations are, in fact, creating mappings and and changing the conversations as they go because you know now it's not uncommon to find even highly skeptical people like Bart er- Bart Ehrman and other scholars and Horn makes these the Christian apologists usually make these points that almost everyone agrees that it's not a fable because the first century disciples just made it up no you don't you don't People on that scale don't lose their life for a lie. Uh, they saw something. What was it? Some, you know, and again, you can go through the, the the various menu elements. Was it some mass delusion? Was it some, you know, who knows? I mean, and this is this is the point about human experience and cognition that we're, you know, I, I listen to these things and, you know, the point, the skeptics make some good points. Yeah, human beings... Our grasp on the world is is pretty tangential and pretty um, pretty flimsy, but that point goes all the way round. You say, yeah, well, if I can, you know, have certain processes that I can distill down into into physical causation, then and I say, yeah, well and good, but most of our life is not like that, and and so you know, I often hear about the God of the gaps, and I've made this point before. Uh, my God number one, God number two. In many ways, God number one is not the missing puzzle piece that you fudge the puzzle picture with. He's the table beneath the puzzle when you don't have the piece that fits. In other words, it's it's your assumed narrative of the world that you default to. And so 
for example, Rationality Rules tells a story about he's driving his motorcycle and he, he somehow intuitively knows when to slow down. And then he makes up a story of somehow some other member of his consciousness congress saw a car slow down and and that somehow you know psychologically impacted him so he knew you know the little voice in his head said, said slow down and he believed the little voice why do you believe the little voice it's because you have faith in something and it's and it's and it's the table underneath the puzzle that's actually making up your worldview and you know call myself a good presuppositionalist but that table is not subject is not highly subject to our volition. And whenever I talk about formation, that's really what's making the table. It's it's all of that mapping that we start doing as a child and and it's the constant recalibration that we're we're always working on. And when we see a, you know, and and, and of course the Protestant Reformation is is the, you know, the pushing back against bullshittery writ large. See, if I put it in the middle of a big word, some of you who were with more sensitive ears might not be so offended. <laughs> but it's, it's you know, it, it's it's mass skepticism in some ways. And, okay, so, well, lots of parts of babies get strewn across the lawn when the bathwater goes out. Um, and, and so we're always, you know, going out into the yard and picking up parts of babies and thinking, huh, shouldn't have thrown this out. Maybe I'll bring that back. And that's an awfully gory de- that's an awful gory image, but uh, in my opinion, in my experience as a pastor, gory images stick because one of the things that pastors do major and maybe not maybe isn't always so much just rationality and rules of debate, but rather um, evocative images that can stick in your mind because pastors are, of course, natural colonizers. That's our job. And that's why I, I just seldom have a whole lot of, I listen to these debates and I always pick up some things from them and I sort of tuck them away in my mental file cabinets, but that's not what moves regular people's lives. And as a pastor, that's really what I care about, moving regular people's lives. And of course, Newton, I made this point, I think, in the Friday question and answer. Newton was practicing natural theology. Why? Because God number one, he was he was pursuing the pieces of the of the of the puzzle that aren't there. And he's trying to he he understands that in a lot of ways these pieces emerge from the table. All right. It's a very different image about puzzle making. I mean, imagine if the well, you can probably get a better idea of it now with uh, computer puzzles. I've seen a few of these online. We, we take intuitive leaps to guess at what might be right there in that blank space in our puzzle. And so we, we imaginatively lean into them. And what do we use to do that? We use stories. That's where the superhero stories and the fiction and the mythology, that's what all of that's doing. It's all, it's all trying to penetrate into the table in order to see the puzzle piece grow out of it. I mean, that's what that's what early that's that's the basis of scientists that they're penetrating into the table because they want to know God more. And and that's almost exactly the definition of knowing a person. And and so you know, let's say Let's say you're a young single person and because we're doing a lot of this conversation on the Discord too. You're a young single person and and you just feel a you just feel a pull for <laughs> you want to go on the bachelor so you can find true love. And you're you're pulled toward it and you're drawn towards it. And then you meet a person and you don't know why. And and this 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 story is so common. Just ask people who have been couples for a long time. You know, you walked into a room and you saw that person across the room. And some people have the experience of saying, I'm going to marry that person. They knew it right away. Well, why did they know it? Well, it's not unscientific. In fact, psychologists go into that. I remember the I remember the moment I saw my wife for the first time. I remember it. She immediately caught my attention. And now those of you who... Those of you who have been watching my channel know I'm actually a very patient stalker, um, and so you know I, I, 
I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have the confidence that I could run over to her and invite, you know, introduce myself, never having met her before, yada, yada, yada. No, I took my time, but, um, I achieved my goal. And, and, and so this is sort of what natural theology is. And this is sort of the way we actually learn and fill out the world. And now let me draw those connections because they're probably what, what, Isaac Newton did to God was what someone who looks across a college campus or a or a bar or a party or a church and and sees someone knowing nothing about them mind you sees someone and thinks either that's a person I want to get to know or that's a person I want to marry and, and then what you spend your time doing is investigating, going further into that person, learning them, understanding. And of course, there's there's enormous projection going on there and back and forth. And but but you keep looking and hopefully your projections keep you focused there. And hopefully the person on and on and on will begin to emerge from your projections and you'll actually know something that's far more real than just the projecting that you're doing on this person for all of your own, for all of your own needs. So we take these intuitive leaps to guess at what might be not only holding up the puzzle pieces, but the pieces that will emerge into the puzzle to the degree that the puzzle sitting on the table is a, a good and correct mapping of 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 everything of of what it is we want to know and then we try on stories that are fantastical you know i don't know why i'm so dim sometimes sometimes i think of things it's like i don't know why i didn't think of this three years ago you know archetypal i don't know archetypal 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 arche look up look up what what the greek word arche means and look up what the greek word tupos means tupos is a mark left with a strike or a blow think about a typewriter it's an archetypal story it's sort of the the mark left and and boy that goes down far and boy that fractals out um i'm not communicating i'm just thinking if I'm just thinking in my head and not moving my lips, doesn't help you all much, does it? It's part of the reason I do these videos is because it prompts thoughts in my heads. But we're playing around with images to do our, our story nav dead reckoning. Story navigation dead reckoning. That's what we're doing. And that's why we're mapping and we're constantly mapping the inside and the outside. And we look at comic books and, and why are comic book characters so strange well, it's because they're like in our dreams. They're archetypal. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're uncluttered images. But, but it's part of what we're bringing, and it's part of what's out there, and it's part of the community. And, you know, we watch children do this, but I guess I'm more and more convinced we never stop. At least... If we're healthy, we never stop. You know, we're, we're always working on our stuff. And, and, and little children, I mean, they're learning first how to use their hands and their mouth. And, and then they're just watching. And they're just absorbing and absorbing. And they don't even know what they're doing. They're, they're just absorbing all of this stuff. And at some point in the future, like when they, when they get married or have a child, they'll realize, I've been imprinted by my parents. Look, that's my first draft of who I am and what I do. And, and that just continues on and on and on and on. And so we're always working on our stuff and we don't even know what we're doing. We just move on to larger and larger projects and projects and we're trying to map the whole world. And as we're doing it, we're feeling the meaning. You know, children, when they're walking around watching adults, why are they doing it? Meaning is driving them. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and it'll drive them through pain. And it'll drive them through pleasure. And of course, my big question is always, where does the church fit in? And and so I, you know, I've been talking about platforms, and now I'm thinking I'm going to add another word to platforms, which are which are pathways, because I've also been impressed recently how, 
you, you take a fork in the road and it starts you down a road and, and it's the formation of that road that, that is so determinative of who, you begun, you, who you've begun. Human beings start down a road and the road forms us more than the sign on the road did. And, and so, of course, the church was one of these church, temple, palace, you know, one of these very ancient platforms that deeply formed. But now we've got the, the formation has just split and fractured. And so now we look for, you know, of course, Protestant church did that. And, and I would expect that, that, that the Protestant church did that because it was already happening in the people in Europe. The church had lost its grip. Maybe I'll read a little bit of that chapter that I was thinking about. The rise of Protestantism caught the Catholic Church by surprise. This is not to say that Catholics lacked resolve or eloquent advocates, but rather that the, the Catholic leadership as a whole failed to understand the nature and extent of this new heretical threat and therefore also failed to react quickly and effectively. From the very start in 1517, when Leo X dismissed Luther's run-in with, with Johann Tetzel as monkish squabble between a Dominican and, and an Augustinian, the response from the very top was torpid. By the time Leo got around to excommunicating Luther in 1519, it was too late. Luther had already secured the political support that would enable him to survive and thrive, and at the Diet of Worms in 1521, the imperial battle against the new heretics was already lost before it began. With Elector Frederick the Wise and other princes on his side, Luther could thumb his nose at the young Emperor Charles V and get away with it. And, and you see here that, of course, the world had already changed. It was too late, at least for the Catholics at that point, in terms of what their goals were. No matter how loudly or how eloquently they condemned him, those who opposed Luther on paper or face-to-face -face were unable to stop him. Um, Cardinal Tomas de Vio, better known as, um, I want to say Cajetan, uh, which is more of a Spanish, Cajetan, which is kind of an ang anglicized, was the first to grapple with Luther at the Diet of Augsburg in October 1518 and the first uh, and the first to denounce him with authority. But Cajetan could do nothing to stop the firestorm that was already sweeping through parts of Germany. The eminent cardinal would never give up the fight, but all of his attempts were aimed at were aimed high and aimed too high at the theological stratosphere rather than the man or the woman on the street. Cajetan would would compose would compose detailed Latin refutations of Lutheran theology concerning the primacy of the Pope, 1521, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, 1525, the sacrificial dimension of the Mass, 1531, and the cooperation between human will and grace, 1535. But these learned treaties could not diminish Luther's popularity. Why? The platform had, had, had already gone out. Cajetan seemed to have a grip on what made Luther popular, and he displayed a flexibility that later polemicists would lack. But at the very same time, he also demonstrated a cluelessness about what it would take to resolve the religious crisis caused by Luther. In 1530, for example, a, um, he suggested to Pope Clement VII that the Lutherans could be brought back into the Catholic fold with merely two concessions, clerical mar marriage and allowing the, la the laity to receive both the bread and the wine in communion. And as I noted before, the, the Swiss Reformation had already far outstripped Luther in many ways, especially by 1530. Others immediately joined Cajetan on the battlefield, but they too kept their aim too high. John Eck, um, Eronymus Emser, Joe, and a whole bunch of others. I can't read all their, all their names. And as other leaders emerged in the Protestant camp, these Catholic polemicists took them on too. But Luther and his brethren would ridicule, would ridicule their Catholic opponents with impunity, a result of the protection they received from secular authorities and of their access to the printers and the publishers. Moreover, when the Catholics entered the fray at the personal level, as Cochleus did when he wrote a biography of Luther, their focus tended to be on the theological errors of the Protestants they opposed rather than on the issues more accessible to the laity. In other words, Catholic apologists sought to undercut the integrity of Protestantism at a high intellectual level but pointing to, um, by pointing to its most apparent fundamental flaws, novelty, inconsistency, and plurality. 
If the leading Protestants contradicted themselves and disagreed with one another, argued Catholic apologists, how could they possibly lay claim to the truth? And how could these newcomers dismiss centuries of traditions as error? But, again, everyone else was just dead reckoning, using the story verse, massively compressing everything, recalibrating, remapping, and this was happening at an enormous scale. And so by the time the, I mean, the church, the Catholic church shows itself to be just too established, too old, not in touch. And of course, the reformers, they didn't have all the advantages that the Roman Catholic church had. So what advantages they had, they used, but happy for them. Those were the advantages, the advantages du jour. And yeah, this is what's happening. So again, my quest is continues to be for the church. Where does the church fit in? Fit in? How do we navigate this? How do I as a pastor continue to figure out what the gospel is, figure out what the Christian life should look like today? figure out how to articulate these things, figure out how to talk to regular people, figure out how to posture myself in the far bigger world. It seems no better goal. Anyway, so there's Sunday leftovers for you. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think.